Well, again, my name is Morris Lentz, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, I'm friends with Tim Hester and his family, and they attended church at Rogersville for a, for a few years, and, and I became uh, good friends with them. And he asked me back in December if I would like to come and speak to the good folks here at Cross Point, and I said, I think I want to. So um, I'm one of the regular song leaders at the Rogersville Church of Christ, uh, me and Mr. Mickey Beavers, who's also one of our elders. We serve in that capacity on a weekly basis, and um, and I've been a member of the, of the Rogersville Church of Christ all of my life. Uh, my, my mom uh, took me there when I was about that small, and I obeyed the gospel when I was 11 years old, and uh, my dad was a former deacon there, still a faithful member, and as well as my mother, they still attend there, so very thankful for my family and very thankful for the, for the good folks at the Rogersville Church of Christ. I do have a little connection here with Cross Point. Every year, uh, you so graciously allow the volunteer firefighters every year to have our banquet here. And we have that here in February of each year. And this is the place that we love because it's such a wonderful place and all the good folks here make us so welcome. So thank you very much for the use of your facilities for all the volunteer firemen here in, uh, in Lauderdale County. If you notice the songs that I, that I led today dealt with Jehovah, his, his powerful name, and how we should praise him. And also with the song, Each Step I Take, that is, a, that is a song that's very dear to me, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. I'm a native of Rogersville, lived there all my life, born there. I work there, work at the local bank in town. But I'm very proud not only to be a Christian, that's the first thing I'm proud about, but second of all, I'm very proud to be a part of the Rogersville community. For 30 years, I have helped serve the Rogersville community as a volunteer firefighter in our town. I started when I was uh, 18 years old in 1983. And as a matter of fact, one of the deacons at our church was the fire chief. So if you're in a small town like Rogersville, we saw everybody sort of wears the hat. But the, the fire chief at the time was Mr. James O'Neill Embry from Rogersville. And um, he, he cornered me into being a volunteer fireman in our town. My dad was a volunteer fireman in Rogersville for many years. And I can remember being little and hearing the fire alarm go off on the water tank. And at 3 in the morning, my dad would get up and he would get dressed and he would go. And I would always be afraid. I would think, well, is he going to make it back? Um, and I don't think I'd ever want to do that because it, it was pretty scary. One of the most vivid memories I had is when my dad was at a house fire and Back then, they didn't have much equipment, and he'd come out of a roof. They had a fire up in an attic somewhere. He'd come out of the roof, and he was covered in, uh, covered in a, um, insulation, and uh, he scared me. I thought, who is that ghost coming out of the, coming out of the roof? But it was my dad. And, and from that point forward, I was, little, I was respectful for the, for the volunteer firemen in, my, in our community, and especially for my dad. My dad never encouraged me to, to take this line of profession. But he also didn't disencourage me, so for that I'm very thankful. Uh, currently, I'm the assistant fire chief in Rogersville. Um, Rogersville is a town of about 2,000 people. We serve a community of about 5,000 in total. But I've served from the assistant chief to the chief to the lieutenant to the hose washer to the to the truck washer, you name it. And, and we've got some fire chiefs here now in, in the audience that I'm dear friends with, so they know what I'm talking about. So, But currently I serve as the assistant chief of the fire department here in Rogersville, and also I'm also the vice president of the Lauderdale County Association of Volunteer Fire Department. So that's something that I'm very proud about. So let's get into our devotional. And this is something that's very dear to me. I presented this to the local youth group at Rogersville. Uh, I spoke to some youth groups at Jackson Heights, and also I've spoken to a, a church in Double Springs uh, not too long ago. So this is a story that is very dear to me. It's a very true story, and bear with me. There may be times when I may not make it through, so just bear with me because sometimes the wounds are still fresh. But uh, again, thank you for having me. The topic tonight is the joy of Job. You think to yourself, Job, joy. Boy, those two don't go together. You know, of, of, of any two words that, 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 that are opposite of each other, it's the word Job and joy. 
But you know, there's only one letter difference between the word Job and joy, and it's the letter Y. And you know, Job asked the question of the Lord when he was, when the Lord let Satan uh, have his way with Job. Job asked the question, why? And if you read on into the book of Job, especially toward the end of Job, Job gets a little bit on his high horse and says, you know, I know everything, God. Uh, maybe uh, I'm the one that needs to be telling you how things are going. And, if you've, and, I'll, and my favorite portion of the Bible is the last books of Job. The Lord tells Job right quick who's in charge. He goes so far as to tell him who set the corners of the earth. He asks Job, where does the winds come from? Where does the lightning come from? Where is the snow stored? What makes the, the animals act the way they do? So God certainly put Job in his place. But I believe with all my heart that Job had joy. You ask yourself, what does the word joy mean? Well, there's, several, there's two types of joy in my opinion. There's immediate joy and there's everlasting joy. As a Christian, I enjoy the everlasting joy. Let me explain it this way. You go to Disney World, you go to Six Flags, or you go to the fair over here in Muscle Shoals, and you get on that ride, maybe on that roller coaster, and you're in that car, and you're thinking to yourself, man, this is going to be fun. This is going to be a great ride if it don't tear up and throw me off, but uh, <laughs> like some of them. But this is going to be a great ride. You get in the car, it starts going up the hill, you hear the click, 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 especially on the, on the roller coaster at Six Flags. You can't help but hear that one. You get to the very top and you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm the happiest person in the world because I'm fixing to go down this hill about 60 miles an hour. You get to the top, you go down, you're going through the twists and the turns, twist in the turns, and you're the most joyous person in the world. You're laughing, you're screaming, you're holding your hands up. But what happens when the car gets back into the station? Huh. That was it. Let's do that again. So then you go over to the next ride and you do that. But that's an example of an immediate joy. That joy does not last. That joy is there and it's over with. But that's not the kind of joy that I experience or that I have in, in, in the Lord. I have that everlasting joy. Let me read for you for just a moment the first book of Job. And I think it's very important. And I want you to listen as I read, if you don't mind. There was a man in the, in the country of us named Job. He was a man of perfect integrity who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to have banquets, each at his house in turn. They would send an invitation to their, to their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them, rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for, them, for all of them. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned, having cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered, and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household, and everything he owns? You have blessed his work with, with his hands, and his possessions are spread out of the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns, and he will surely curse you to your face. Very, very well, said the Lord to Satan. Everything he owns is in your power. However, you must not lay a hand on Job. So Satan went out from the Lord's presence. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and reported, while the oxen were plowing and the donkeys grazing nearby, the Sabaeans swooped down and took them away. They struck down the servant with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when another messenger came and reported, a lightning storm struck from heaven. It burned up the sheep and the servants and devoured them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. 
That messenger, that messenger was still speaking when yet another came and reported. The Chaldeans formed three bands, made a raid on the camels, took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when another messenger came and reported. Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in in the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on the young people so that they died. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshiped, saying, Naked I come from, the, from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of the Lord. Throughout all of this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. Let me share with you my personal Job story. On February the 7th, at approximately midnight, I had returned home from, um, from Florence, and I decided to, well, 12 o'clock at night's sort of early for me to go to bed, so I thought, well, I'm going to go to bed and get a good night's sleep. Went to bed, and as a volunteer fireman, as you well know, we always have our radios, we have our pagers, we have everything that we, we need to be alerted for a call. We have those beside our bed. I took my pager, set it beside my bed, had the radio there, had all my gear, or excuse me, had my clothes laid out, ready for the next call. At approximately 1 a.m., my pager went off and said, you said, Rogers, well, you're, re you're reporting to a structure fire in the Elgin Fire District on Highway 101. I woke up, listened to the call, got my clothes on, and it's customary, we always get on our radios and we'll radio each other and say, all right, Chief, uh, this, is, this is Rogersville 2 at the time. Well, no, I was Rogersville 5 at the time. This is Rogersville 5. I'm en route to the station or where do you need me to go? And the Chief said, well, you're close to the station. Go ahead and pick up the fire truck. I'll be there shortly to go with you. Several of the firemen radioed in and said, all right, we're going to go. We're going to go in our personal vehicles. We'll meet you on the scene. Good enough. Get to the station, open the doors. Uh, my gear is sitting on the hooks. Put my boots on, put my coat on, put my helmet on, get the gloves ready. Get in, the, get in our tanker truck. Now, a tanker truck is a truck that carries water naturally, and, this, and this, these kind of trucks we send to our neighboring departments to help them with water if they need it. The chief gets in the fire truck with me and says, all right, let's go. And I said, all right, let's get the address. We got the address on our, on our phones. We head out that way. Uh, one o'clock in the morning, not much traffic, but it's, it's rather cold, rather chilly when we're driving down the road. And as I get close to, to a second creek, I can see the orange glow of, a, uh, of the fire. And I said, well, Chief, there it is. I said, looks like it's a working fire. So we flip over to, the, to our neighboring fire department's radio channel, and sure enough, it is a working fire. Not sure if anybody's inside or not. They just got there. But Elgin's doing a good job. They're putting the fire out. Uh, we hear Center Star come on the scene, a good friend of mine by the name of David Charles. I could hear him on the radio. Uh, looks like we have a working fire, and they said, Rogersville, when you come up, what, you, what, what we'll need you to do is pull your truck um, here at the driveway, and we'll use you for water supply. I said, okay, sounds good. And usually being the driver, you're usually the pump operator, and that's pretty much an easy job. Your, your job is just to make sure the guys get the water and, and you're not dealing with anything really dangerous. So a little side note, uh, we get to the scene and sure enough, there's the fire. Well, I noticed that there was a car blocking the driveway and this car was sitting right in the middle of Highway 101. The fire was south of uh, 72 on 101. Notice there was a car that was sitting right in the middle of the road running. And none of the fire trucks could get by. And I thought, well, what is this moron doing in the middle of the road? we got to get these fire trucks by. So I get out, and I walk over to the car, and there's nobody there. And I thought, this is extremely odd. 
Well, I thought, well, let's see. What did they do in the movie Backdraft? They got an axe and a pole, and they went in there and started breaking the windows. And I thought, well, I can't do that, but we've got to get these fire trucks up to the scene. So, you know, what, whatever we need to do. And all of a sudden, a man comes running down the hill, and he says, it's my car. And I said, buddy, what are you doing parking in the middle of the, of the highway with your car running and it locked up? He, he, I, I promise you, he looked at me and said, I don't know. So I, I think he might have saw the fire and got out to help and he locked his keys in his car. Well, he, he was so despondent, he took a rock and he started beating on the side of the, of the car to open his keys. And I said, hold, oh, buddy. And I said, let's, let's, let's wait just a minute. So we went and got an ax and got a pot pole and we found a little way to get inside of the side of, get into the side of his car opened it up got the keys out or opened it up where he could get in he drove off thank you see you later i pulled the fire truck up to the side of the of the road where we're supposed to be and sure enough the fire chief says uh, you're going to be the water supply guy good deal so we're sitting there waiting for water to come from, or for me to take water to the, to the neighboring fire department that's up on the hill fighting the fire. And you'd know with any kind of a firefighter, sometimes you get a little antsy and you think, well, you know, I want to get in there where the action is. Maybe it's, uh, this is a little bit too boring out here. Well, one of, the, one of our firefighters radioed and he said, uh, it was a good friend of mine, Chad Menard, he radioed and he said, do we have a wet fire extinguisher on the fire engine? We need one up here in the attic. And I radioed back. I said, no, I don't think we do. We took that off the other day. We haven't replaced it, but we don't have that. And he said, well, I need some help up here. Well, knowing me and wanting to get into the thick of things, I looked at the chief and I said, chief, do you mind if you'll sit by the truck, I'll go up there and I'll suit up and I'll try to help these guys with the actual fire. Do you mind? And he says, no, that's fine. Just, and I remember, be careful. Famous last words. Uh, picked up my air pack, had my gear, put my gear on. Well, I already had my gear on, put my air pack on. And I can remember that the driveway was a very long driveway. And by the time I got to the very end of it, I thought, man, I'm just going to be give out by the time I get to the end and, and I'm going to be too beat to fight the fire. We get there and the fire chief from Center Star comes up and says, look, we've got electrical lines everywhere. We need some help. Uh, there's, there, there's been some guys that have almost stepped on these. Can you go inside the house and maybe find where the electrical box is? Sure. So I met the fire chief of Elgin, and we went inside the house. And I noticed the house was an odd-looking house. It was a house that uh, it, it looked like a normal single-family dwelling. But in just a minute, uh, I'll show you a picture of what we looked at. The person had built this house, and I, the best way I can describe it was out of railroad ties. Uh, they laid these thousand pound railroad ties and they made a log cabin out of it and they used uh, spikes as their uh, as their stabilizer for their walls. We go inside, the guy was an avid hunter obviously, noticed a bunch of animals on the wall. We cut the power off. I come outside and I noticed my good friend Kenny Wright, who was the fire chief um, of Elgin at the time. He's up in the attic of the house. And if I can have that first picture, I'll show you what I'm talking about there. There it is. Uh, as you can see, the house was, I call them railroad ties. But there's the attic that was on fire. Now, to sort of give you an idea what it looked like, the house was over here, and there was a detached garage on this side. The detached garage is what caught on fire. And the detached garage, had, the roof had burned out of it. So all that was left was the three walls. The fire had radiated and was catching the house on fire. So we get there, and this is, in the, this is like at 2 in the morning. And my friend, Kenny, is up in that loft up there. As a matter of fact, you can see a, a fire extinguisher up there. So I, I climb up there on the ladder, and I said, Kenny, do you need some help? He said, yeah, crawl up here with me. We've got some hot spots up here, but I think the house is okay. Looks like it just burned the outside. But we are going to need some help. All right. So I crawl up in the, uh, in the attic with him. And as you know, being a fireman, we laugh and joke and pick at each other. And, and Kenny, not only is Kenny a great firefighter, he's also a member of the church with me at Rogersville. So we have a, we have a, a double bond, I guess you could say. So we get up in top, and we're, we're working, and um, we're getting it out. 
And the other firemen are over here at the garage, and they're putting the fire out, putting out hot spots. Well, I climb out of the ladder, climb down, and as I climb down, Kenny Wright is climbing down. And instead of climbing down like you normally do, backwards, he starts coming out of it frontwards. So I make fun of him. I said, well, is that how they t taught you to climb ladders at Elgin? And he just laughs and says, no, we just do it better than you do in Rogersville. So we got our, we got our shots in. And he climbed down. And, and I'm standing right over here, about right here, I guess it is. And we're talking and we're laughing. And, and I said, well, Kenny, I said, uh, looks like we're going to get through uh, pretty quick with this fire, don't you think? He said, yeah, I think we are. And I says, maybe, maybe we'll get home early enough that uh, we'll, uh, we won't have to sleep late or whatever. He said, I don't think so. And I said, you know, were y'all not getting a new fire truck uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future? And he said, well, he said, we're looking at it. And I said, well, you know, if you need some help financing that fire truck, come see me. And he said, well, he said, I will, we'll certainly do that. And I said, well, Kenny, I said, uh, uh, what do you think? Of, what do you think about if we come over here? And and then it happened. Everything went dark. It was dark. There was silence. It felt as if 20 grown men had jumped on my back and drove me straight in the ground. It dazed me for a second, and I thought, what in the world just happened? I could hear faint voices and I could hear crackling noises and I'll tell you later what, the, what those noises were later. And I'm going to be very honest with you. The first thing that went through my mind, I thought, oh no, I'm trapped. The wall has fallen, the wall has failed, I'm trapped. The, the moon has fell out of the sky. Whatever it is, I can't move and I can't breathe. I noticed the heel of my foot was facing forward where my body was turned the other way. And I felt a very burning sensation in my leg. And, and, in, this, and in these milliseconds, I'm thinking to myself, what in the world has just happened to me? And then it hit me, I thought the roof, the wall has caved in on me and I, and I can't get out and they don't know I'm under here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you think the first thing that went through my mind was they're going to come get me? Just give it time. Let's, get, let's let all your firefighting training kick in. It didn't. Let me tell you, the first thing that went through my mind and I wrote it down Oh, God, no. Please, God, no. Please, God, please help me. Please, God, don't let me die like this. I was praying because I knew I knew where my I knew where my list I knew where my list I knew where my destiny was. Sure, I'd been a member of the church, but I had not been acting like I should. I hadn't been faithful coming to church. And I knew right then that my life was in God's hands. And I kept praying over and over to God. I said, oh God, please don't let it be too late, please. Please, God, please. And when you're in those situations, you sometimes think 
do you see white lights? Do you see these, these, these glows? Do you see angels? You don't. You see nothing but blackness and despair. Because I knew, ladies and gentlemen, what my destination was. There was no question. And you know, when you get in these predicaments and you get in these situations, you start bargaining with God. And you say, if you let me out of this, I promise I'll do better. I didn't make any bargains with God because I knew. I'd grown up in the church. I was baptized into Christ. I knew what the word grace meant. But I thought to myself, you know, here I have turned myself away from God for the last five or six years, and all of a sudden I need him. I need him right now. And you wonder, and, and maybe I'm wrong in saying this. I'm just being honest with you, and I just wonder. I mean, I know, I know our God is gracious, and he's understanding, and he's forgiving. But if you turn your back on him all the way up until 30 seconds before you die, does he listen? That is, it, that is a position that I hope none of you folks are ever in. It is the most horrifying, scary experience to know that you are about to die and that your destination is hell. It's that simple. There's no beating around the bush. I had no doubt in my mind that if I died that night, that my destination was not with God. I wasn't closing my eyes saying, please, God, please take me away. Take me home with you. I was saying, dear God, please do not let me go to hell. Please don't. The second thing that went through my mind was the firefighters at Moulton. This is exactly the way they died. Uh, they were fighting the fire, and the wall fell on those, two, those guys and suffocated them. They went through my mind. And if you've ever had a near-death experience, all these things just go through your mind, and you're thinking, you know, I, you know Marsh, you've been talking for 15 minutes. No, this, this happens in seconds. And I thought, well, maybe... If I breathe, if I breathe out and cause some room between the wall and the ground, I can get some room to breathe. The crackling noise and the, and the popping I told you about earlier, that was my back. It broke my back. It broke all of my ribs. It gave me a concussion and it fractured both my hips and it snapped this leg into my left leg. As I breathed out, I did get some room to breathe, but the um, the rib had punctured my lung, so I couldn't breathe. And as I breathed out, the weight pushed me deeper and deeper. Well, by this time, I thought, well, it's over with. It's it's done, you know. And honestly, you you you, I promise you, folks, your mind goes to places that you never think about. You know, you, you think to yourself, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do what I want to, God. I'm going to come over here, and, and, and I'll get cancer. That's it. I'll get cancer, and, and just before I die, I'll get my life right, and I'm going to heaven. Or maybe uh, I, I'll be in a car wreck, and, and maybe, uh, you know, they, they've got me in intensive care, and I'm going to get my life right before I die. Or maybe I'm old age, and maybe, they, maybe I'm, I've got Alzheimer's or something, and I decide to to uh, get my life right before I die. It doesn't work like that. God does not guarantee you tomorrow or the next minute. And that was a gamble that I had made with God, and I was on the losing end real quick. I closed my eyes, and my exact words to God was, Dear God, I'm so sorry. Please don't let it be too late. I breathed out, and I closed my eyes, and I, I decided that's it. I could feel myself drifting out, about to pass out. And all of a sudden, I saw a little bitty, little bitty glimmer of light just right over to my, yeah, to my right. 
and I could see some light. And I took, I took my glove, and this is the glove I had on that night. I took this glove. Wrong, wrong hand. I took this glove. No, that's the right one. I took this glove, and I reached out. And one last time, I did this right here, and I beat on the ground. And then I heard a voice. And the voice said, it's Morris. We found him. Let me tell you something. I was, for a second, I thought, is that the way God sounds? He sounds like Kenny Wright, you know. <laughs> does, does God have the same voice as my friend Kenny Wright? But I thought, wait a minute. No, they do know I'm under here. I reached out. And Kenny said, we've got him. He's here. He's okay. And I'm thinking, no, no, no. I'm not okay. Get this wall off of me. They got a bunch of guys together. I could hear them running. I could hear them talking. I still couldn't breathe. I, I, we figured that I couldn't breathe for about a minute and a half. And if you've ever just stopped breathing, I mean, I'm talking about not get a deep breath. It, it's hard to breathe. The guys got around me, picked up the wall. They got the wall up about six inches, and it broke, fell back on me. Then that's when it broke the back of my hips, and that's when it gave me the concussion. Um, my helmet is what saved me from having a, a brain injury. Let me let you hold that right there. It, uh, well, you can't see it. I'll show it to you later, but it broke the, the bill. And some of you firemen here know if you break a fire helmet, that's some pretty heavy stuff. But the helmet, the helmet kept me from having a concussion. They picked it up. They, they lifted it off of me. And here were my, exact, here were my next words. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Y'all, please help me. I'm hurt. Please, God, help me. At that time, a couple of paramedics come up. They pick me up. They said, get the helicopter here quick. He's hurt. They rolled me on my back, but my leg stayed where it was. It was buried in the ground, and I knew then that my leg had been broken. Usually, the uh, ambulance folks will send a paramedic and a driver. That night, they sent three paramedics and two drivers. I can remember that night with the machine hooked up to me, and I could hear my heartbeat. I could see my blood pressure start to, to, to lower. And then I felt this warm sensation, and that was them putting in the morphine to help me with my pain. I could hear the helicopter coming, and I thought, you know. And, 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 and this whole time, I'm praying. Every second, I'm praying. I'm saying to myself, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Just let me survive. Let me survive. Let me survive. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Please help me. They put me on 15 liters of oxygen. The, the, the medics come from the helicopter company, got me on the helicopter, and they took me to Athens Hospital. Uh, I can remember when I went into the ER at Athens Hospital, I can remember the sights and the sounds. I remember my mom and dad come up, and my mom put her hand on my shoulder, and she said, Son, are you okay? And I lied to her. I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm going to be all right. But, you know, I didn't know if I was going to wake up. And even though I had prayed to God at that point, and even though that I had begged him to forgive me, and, and even though I said, God, please stay with me, help me, I still wasn't convinced that I was. Now, that is no disrespect to our creator. My, my whole point in saying that was, you play the game the way you want to for 10 years, and then all of a sudden you need his help. It makes you wonder. It makes you wonder. I was in, ten, I was in intensive care for 10 days. The most horrible things were the, uh, the fact that they would make me uh, um, get up and start coughing. Uh, the doctor would come up to me and said, you have to start coughing because you're going to get pneumonia. Uh, and I said, you know, Doc, I'm not going to cough. And they said, well, the next thing is to put you on a ventilator. We put you on a ventilator, and then you die. Let's start coughing. So, so we started coughing right at that at that point. I remember they taped a, uh, I remember they taped a, uh, a, a button to my arm, and it was for morphine. And they said you need to push it only 40 every 45 minutes. I pushed it every minute, and it it wouldn't give me what I needed. But my brother and sister arrived. They sat with me. I cried. Uh, the nurses were with me at Huntsville Hospital. And 
I called and asked our minister to come, to come be with me, uh, Mr. Alex Bays from, from Rogersville. He walked in the room, and I said, Alex, please pray, pray for me. And we prayed. He asked God to forgive me and to heal me. Then the floodgates opened. I cried for over an hour with Alex, and I couldn't understand why God let me live. It didn't make any sense. Alex said, God is always right, and to put my full trust in him. So I prayed each and every minute that I was in the hospital. My doctor came in the next week and said, you're not going to hear this, but we're going to have to fuse your back. And I said, what does that mean? He says, well, we're going to, do op we're going to have to operate and put two rods down each side of your spine, uh, and that'll be that way for life. And um, I currently have two of these in my back. That's why I don't stand up straight. Um, and uh, he said, that's something you're going to have to live with all your life. And I started crying, and I said, God, please take this away from me. I, I, don't, I can't go through any more pain. Sure enough, we had the operation. I came through it okay. When I woke up from that surgery, I noticed that there was a tube coming out of my chest into a, into a I call it a bucket. It was, a, it was some kind of reservoir. But obviously, I had some internal injuries, and my insides were bleeding. And that was the chest tube that they were using to, uh, to, to drain some of the fluid. Uh, my leg was in a cast. The, st the staff kept giving me medicine. But here's the thing. They sent in several doctors, and I would see doctors on a daily basis, and the, the doctors that I could not stand were the psychiatrist. Now, a lot of folks think I'm nuts, and I probably am, but the folks that I could not stand to talk with were the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist would come in, and they wouldn't talk to me. They would just tell my parents, well, he's had a traumatic injury. Uh, he is crying because he's depressed. Uh, he's had a near-death experience. Let's give him some medicine. I said, I don't need the medicine. I'm not crying because I'm sad. And, he, and, the, and, the, and the doctors would say, well, but you do need to take the Zoloft or whatever the junk they give me. And you've got to take that because you are having some mental issues. And I thought, well, I've always, I've always had mental issues, but, uh, um, it, you know, I've, I've just experienced a near-death experience. So I let them win. I took their medicine. Didn't feel any different. The thing with being in the hospital was the thing called time. Time passed very slowly. You'd look up at the clock. You'd think it would be 1 o'clock, and then sure enough, it'd be 5 o'clock. And you'd think to yourself, is it tomorrow? Is it the next day? And my goal was to, to, get, out of the, um, to get out of the hospital. One of the presents that I received, my fire chief came to see me, and he brought me my badge, and you're welcome to look at it later. This is the badge that I had when I was the lieutenant, and you can tell where I wore off the, where I sort of wore down the, uh, the front of it, because at night I would hold this badge in my hand and I would pray, and I would thank God for seeing me through, but believe it or not, I would thank God for allowing the wall to fall. And the reason I did that was because maybe it took a wall to jar me into doing the right thing. A good friend of mine came over and they brought me a, 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 a pillow. And this was what was on the pillow. It's the fireman's prayer. It says, when I'm called to duty, God, wherever flames may rage, give me the strength to save a life, whatever be its age. Help me embrace a little child before it's too late or save an older person from the horror of that fate. Enable me to be alert and hear the wicked shout and to quickly and efficiently put the fire out. I want to find my calling and give the best in me to guard my neighbor and protect his property. And if according to your will I have to lose my life, bless with your protecting hand my children and my wife. Throughout this ordeal, I was at different therapies. I went to Spain rehab. I stayed at Health South. I think it was about two months that I was in the hospital. But one day, 
my dad come in and said, the doctor wants you to get in the wheelchair and let's, let's, let's go down the hall. That was some of my exercise. They put me in the wheelchair and I would wheel myself to sort of build up my upper body strength. I said, dad, put me in the wheelchair. Let's, let's ride down the hall uh, at the hospital. So he put me in the wheelchair and I drove down the hall and sure enough, there was a piano in the waiting room. Now I'm a pianist. Uh, I played the piano. I've played since I was, uh, eight years old, took lessons for many years, I can read music. So I said, wheel me in there, Dad. So he wheeled me in. And my dad is a man of very few words. If you know my daddy, he says nothing. <laughs> He's just very quiet. But he wheeled me in, and I said, push me up to the piano. And I wondered to myself, I thought, you know, has can I still play the piano? I mean, I, you know, things were going on in my mind. I thought, am I, am I, am, am I even normal nowadays? So he pushed me up to the piano, and I struck a chord, and I thought, hmm, I can still play. And there was a hymnal on top of the piano, and I picked it up. And I'm not saying that this was divine intervention, but um, I'll just let you, let you take it for what it is. God had not been number one of my list of priorities, and I thought to myself, you know, I'm Morris Lentz. I'm the volunteer fireman in town. I'm the banker. Ain't nothing going to happen to me. I know it all. And I opened up the hymnal, and the song that I opened it up to was, God will... God will take care of you. And I, and I couldn't sing it because I, I just started crying. And uh, um, I just played it and I hummed it. But the fourth verse says, no matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean where he won upon his breast. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. And it's been four years since my accident, and I cannot lead that song at Rogers for because I, I just can't. But at the end of my presentation, we're going to sing that song because I'm going to get by that. So you ask yourself, Morris, what does this have to do with Job? My whole world came crashing down around me four years ago. My health was gone, and the pain that I experienced was unimaginable, sort of like Job. But deep inside my soul, through all of this, I was joyful. And today, I'm very joyful that I have that never-ending joy that I, have, that I have found in God. If everybody, I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. Everybody close your eyes. And I want you to think, at this very moment, your wall has fallen. Where are you in your relationship with God right now? No more chances right now at this very moment. Don't let the wall fall on you without being prepared like I was. It's something that you should never, ever experience. So in closing, thank you very much for having me here tonight. I certainly appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation, Tim, and I uh, always appreciate the good folks here at, uh, at Cross Point. Well, let's sing a good song. Well, they're all good songs. Let's sing our God, He is Alive, and uh, will there be a closing announcement or something? Oh, this is it? Okay. And I tell you what, I want to lead the closing prayer, if that's okay with you. Let's all stand, and we'll sing our God, He is Alive.